You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another interesting episode of Ask Drone You. Very happy to be here. My name is Paul. I am as well, and my name is Rob, and you're listening to episode 675. Thank you, as always, for spending a few minutes of your day with us. We really do appreciate it every single time. We really do, and we're here to help, and we appreciate those reviews and those shares that you have been giving us. Please continue to do that. If you have 30 seconds today, please leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're like me, maybe you stopped listening to Apple Podcasts and you change over to Overcast, or maybe you're an Android user and you listen on Stitcher, or maybe you wait an extra week and you watch the show live on YouTube. Well, wherever you listen to the show, thank you. Please leave us a review. We really do appreciate it. Um, Today's uh, question is going to be brought to you by the DroneU community who has been talking a lot about mapping solutions and been talking a lot about which apps they prefer to use. And I've been seeing a lot of people saying, you know, I love Pix4D Capture, but now I'm moving into Ground Station Pro with all the new features that they have. Hmm. So um, we are headed over to a stadium tomorrow to actually do a test on the unique H520 versus the Phantom 4 Pro and what is going to be better for mapping. So very excited about that. Very excited to release our official review. I was talking to Zach today and just very grateful um, to Unique for letting us do that. And we're going to be shooting a couple shows here in advance just to let you guys know because we are headed to Arizona to do a subject tracking class. Um, As you guys know, I won video of the year this year for wake surfing and we are showing people how Guys like you, listeners, can fly subject tracking in safe environments and get closer shots than normal. We see a lot of videos on YouTube, but everyone's flying super high, and no offense, the shots could be done a little bit better. And all it takes is some systematic practice, as Kay Anders Erickson would say, Mm -hmm. the perfect practice model. Uh, So we're going to be doing that this weekend, and we're very excited about that. So anyway, if you are not a part of the Drone U community, you're definitely going to want to check it out. Just go to thedroneu.com and you'll find out why a community of like-minded learners is so important. But also a special thanks, to, and I almost forgot, to our friends at videoblocks.com forward slash drone. That's V-I-D-E-O-B-L-O-C-K-S dot com forward slash drone. Why? Because if you're like us and you're producing videos all the time, then you know that you're going to need some audio some music, some audio clips, some soundtracks. Maybe you're opening your shot with a shot of the beach and you need some pelicans making some sound to make it feel a little bit more realistic. Well, you can get that and so much more from our friends at videoblocks.com forward slash drone where you pay one low fee and you get access to audioblocks.com and videoblocks.com which has copyright free audio and video for you to use. Check them out. Definitely worth the, your time. All right, Rob. Play Absolutely. That, yeah. Sorry. Play that funky question. I'm sitting here reading some of the other questions we're getting. I'm thinking, we got to get some of those on. All right. Anyways, here we go. Hey, guys. Johnny Scott, Denali Ariel in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, I've been listening to you guys for a while. Got a couple questions in. I listened to an episode just here recently within the last couple of days about mapping. And, Paul, you were speaking about, you know, spending like upwards of eighty, ninety, hundred thousand dollars $100,000 on the tools and the bird that you need. Um, but then I'm thinking back to the mapping that you've been doing of stadiums, athletic stadiums with uh, Phantom 4 Pro. So we have a Phantom 4 Pro and a Mavic Pro. Um, so I'm wondering how is your Phantom 4 Pro equipped to be able to do that kind of mapping. I remember uh, one of your posts on Instagram was uh, something about how accurate it was with the P4P, uh, like 0.03 inches difference uh, or deviation from the other measurements. But uh, is there a way that we can do it? Uh, We wanted to get into some golf course stuff and some real estate mapping. Uh, We have a lot of rural uh, properties out here that we're working with on some real estate stuff. We're doing uh, some action sports uh, videography and things like that. So, any help we could get, uh, we appreciate, and we appreciate all the other stuff that you guys do, tons of free information. We appreciate it very much. It has been a huge asset to us while we've been trying to get this business off the ground and, and get it rolling. So thank you both very much. Johnny, thank you so much for the question. You guys got a lot going on, and certainly mapping is 
potentially a, a good addition. I think maybe we can get started by clarifying. He threw out that $80,000 number, and I think you were talking about something very specific when you were throwing out numbers that big, like very large plots of land and, and the equipment that you might need, some fixed wing kind of stuff is what you were talking about for that, yeah, I Yeah, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about. It could have been LIDAR, it could have been... Um, it could have been larger scale units and mm-hmm. birds. It could have, there's, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. As far as his question is concerned about mapping golf courses in regards to the equipment that he would need, um, I think that there is definitely a viable solution in the Phantom 4 Pro. I think there is also a huge viable solution and maybe even more so viable in the unique Typhoon H520 just because it has its own mapping platform, uh, which we have been testing and using and, and finding very, very, very usable with a lot less restrictions than what you would find on the Phantom 4 Pro. Um, but, you know, as w- at right now, I really think that the unique is a phenomenal option for mapping, uh, again, because longer flight times and... Um, and a great camera to use for mapping. Um, now, that being said, you know, he was asking, I think, what type of payload were we using on the Phantom 4 Pro? It's nothing special, really. Um, and in our uh, mapping class that's coming out, which uh, is in editing right now, very excited to see that first draft this week, um, they, we're talking a lot about weather. And we're talking about why weather is so important for mapping. Because... On days that are sunny and bright, which are great for, you know, aerial videography and cinematography and photography, um, it's, you know, it's quite the opposite for mapping. Um, And again, this is why I think the unique Typhoon H is so powerful. It's because it really takes the contrast down Mm -hmm. in the JPEG recipe. So when I talk about the JPEG recipe, I'm talking about the, the camera's interpolation from the raw image to the JPEG image, which is some sort of formulaic... Um, computer formula that says, hey, you know, our raw photo is taken this way. We need our JPEGs to look this way. And it was funny. Someone the other day was like, I heard the other day that you said that, um, you know, you always shoot in JPEG. And I was like, no, you're not listening to me. I said that I always shoot mapping in JPEG because that's the only way Hmm. that the mapping software reads images. Yeah, you could shoot in RAW, I guess, um, and then uh, take all those images from RAW to JPEG and have your own formulaic recipe. But you... It's not necessary. Not necessary. You also could potentially be inviting a lot of problems. Hmm. Um, If you were to create a formula that works perfectly that you could use every time, um, I think that it is something that is plausible, but even like on the solo R10C, you don't even have the option to shoot raw. So, um, I, I think that you could be inviting a lot of problems by shooting raw and then moving into JPEG when the camera is already set up to remove certain things like barrel distortion in the images so that you don't have images that do not calibrate, um, with, uh, with your mapping software. So it's really important that you are shooting JPEG. So are we doing anything special to our cameras on the P4P? Nope, not really. So when he talks about the kind of accuracy that he is talking about, that he mentioned in his question, the P4P can get can get that done. Yes, it can, but there are so many... Okay, so for example, if you're taking off in a parking lot versus taking off in the nearest field where you have minimal magnetic interference, that can affect your data. This is right. all stuff that's in the class because... I mean, if you if he took off, say, from the stands or if he took off from the concrete instead of taking off from the field, again, that can throw off the data. So, I mean, there with mapping, and, and this is why I'm curious, and I've reached out to our local state police who's been talking about mapping crime scenes with drones. And, um, you know, at Interdrone, they were talking about how the Nevada State Police was mapping with drones, and they said was, but then when you actually watch the footage, they say will be. So it's not a past tense thing. Sure. It's, a, it's a planned acquisition. Well, the issue that I see with crime scene mapping is that you only have one shot at data acquisition. And if you do not follow exact protocols and uh, checklists while you're doing these maps, you could have a very significant problem. In just inaccurate data, not enough data. Correct. And I mean, the, a lot of the, because one of the things that you're going to want to do with that kind of information is to incorporate it into the case. True. And the courts are, I would think, going to be very particular about that, particularly because well, they're learning. Well, right? okay. Let's talk about that for a second. How particular would the courts uh, be? 
And, and, and that's a very good question because if you actually watched, I think it's John Oliver on HBO. Mm-hmm. He recently did his um, Last Week with America. It's essentially his talk show about the news, which is hilarious. And he was, funny, yeah. he, was, he was talking actually about the DNA accuracy and the accuracy of evidence collected in the United States court system. And he was actually providing statistics from um, the office of the president and how they have been going through evidence collection and data. And they were even talking about the FBI's collection of data and then uh, local police collection of data. And nine times out of 10, they get it wrong. And then they're like, and they a, still use it though. Yeah. And like, I think the quote they were using is like, is it, is it reasonable to assume in, in scientific community or something along those lines? I, I got to watch, I got to watch it again. And that's not even a term that's like used in the scientific community. Like it's either, right. it either is or it isn't. It's black or it's white. It's not in between. So actually, I think that there is a very large uh, margin of error when it comes to evidence gathering in this country, which is a significant problem. I mean, they gave the example of this Mm. guy who spent 30 years of his life in prison because they said that a hair proved that he was there at the crime scene and murdered this lady. And they actually took that data set and that sample and they re, you know, they went through again and they looked at, uh, you know, what kind of hairs were actually there. And there were hairs from nine different people and two dogs and the evidence was that was used to prosecute him was a dog hair oh no yeah i mean that's not even funny it's that's not tragic. it's not but yeah. at the same time it's our job you know when we are saying that hey drones can be used to collect data we have to be honest about the accuracy of the data mm-hmm. and also about how the data is collected because we don't just need people going out and training everyone and their mother because they think that they can do it there are real implications to doing this and you know your training and what you teach people is going to have real lifelong implications for certain people whether you realize it or not so going back to crime scene map you know, and, and his question overall about, you know, like what, accuracy what did you and do so forth, and yeah. accuracy and whatnot, where you take off is important. How you collect GPS is important. What type of weather there is, is important. Um, Which in a crime scene, obviously you can't control. You can't correct. go back when the weather's good. Hey, let's just leave this accident in the middle of the highway for a few days and we're going to wait for the clouds to roll <laughs> <That's> in. <right. laughs> I agree. Yeah. That's so not going to work. You have to know how to work around those issues and do the best you can with the circumstances that that are there. I agree. And it's actually funny because in the Harvard Business Review, Chris Anderson was talking about a world in which he hopes to see 3DR, which in all honesty, I really hope he hits this, but I don't see how he's ever going to hit it in all honesty too. So he was talking about, imagine a world where we can use drones and they calculate. And this is, this is how you know that what I'm saying is important. They can calculate... Um, the UV exposure for the day. They can calculate the weather conditions. They can calculate the shadows and then adjust the aerial inspections to, uh, you know, essentially um, compensate for those issues and create better maps. And in all honesty, I think that's a great idea. But what I've learned in this deep dive of mapping, this pretty much the latter half of this year, um, I've realized that I don't think our mapping solutions, our photogrammetry solutions are even ready to produce that type of data because if your shadows change, like if you're taking data in the morning, like this is one of the problems I had with SightScan, you know, it took so many damn batteries to fly one mission. We had to do it over two days. Mm -hmm. And I even tried to do it at the exact same time the next day. But the shadows were so different, it threw off the data. So, I mean, there are layers and layers of information and layers of of steps that need to be taken. In fact, I just reminded myself, there's a guy from Delaware doing crime scene mapping, and I need to reach out to him again. Um, But, uh, you know, it's it's just fascinating to me that the intricacies involved, the mapping involved, and, and, and everything that has to be correct in order to get an accurate map. So I appreciate his question, but again, this is why this class has taken so long to produce because in all honesty, everything has to be right in order for your maps to be as accurate as you need them to be. And a lot of people are like, well, okay, well, we you know why don't I just use LiDAR? Okay, use LiDAR. How are you gonna get color? How are you gonna get buildings to look natural? And let's say you use LiDAR and then you use um, some sort of overall map, you know, to mesh the photogrammetry with the LiDAR. Well, that's great. Well, how are you going to get under structures? Mm -hmm. It's like, 
so many people who think they know what they're doing have not encountered these problems yet, and they're not going to learn how to solve the problem until they encounter it, which is just goes back to why we do what we do, because we really deeply care about this damn industry. We really deeply care about the, you know, what's going on and making a right positive impact. So going back to his question, did we modify our P4P? No, we didn't modify it. Have I tried modifying it to get better maps? Yes, I have. Do I think Unique has done a better job at modifying their vehicle, their one-inch sensor to get better maps? Yes, I do believe that. Um, will I be coming out with a video to showcase that exact difference and what you can expect? Yes, we will be. Are we to a place where we can actually modify our photos, our ISO, our exposure, our settings to get better data in shadow areas and then essentially take regular acquisition or collection of data in non-shadowed areas and merge that together to get better maps? I don't mm. believe our software can do that yet. Mm. So, because we've tried to do it. Oh, if only. Yeah, Life I mean, would be so much easier. It really would. And, you know, it's funny because when we were talking to SiteScan, which we almost bought into, and I'm so happy we didn't, um, they were like, oh, well, you can adjust the ISO. That way you can get better detail. Well, that's great. You can get better detail in those areas. But what happens when the high contrast comes back because you moved out of the shadowed areas back into the regular areas and you set your ISO back down? There's just so many issues um, that have to be overcome. And it's why, and I'm saying this because I want to answer your question simply, but also with the understanding that there are a hundred things that can go wrong. And if you don't systematically go through everything uh, in your acquisition of maps, the, your data is not going to be accurate. And that can affect a lot of people, especially the people that you train. So I think the, the positive of, of, of all of that, because that can sound a little daunting, and, and in some respects it is, but you, there are systems that you can deploy and follow, and you can get to where you need to get to, right? I mean, it is possible. Yes, you're, 100%. You're doing it. It's just not simple. Um, but this is why the classes are there to help people develop those systems and understand how to do it. I agree 100%. Uh, I love what people are doing as far as taking, you know, mapping to different areas. But you guys have just got to be so careful about what you're teaching people and what you're training people. And the expectations are realistic. I mean, this is a big problem, even, you know, with our competitors on just regular flying, let alone the deep data dive, let alone the deep data acquisition of mapping. Like, Oh, you have to be so careful who you learn from and what information you get because it, if you don't get the right information, you're going to be screwed on screwed on screwed on screwed on screwed. And or you, if, even you if won't you... even know how screwed you're going to be because you don't know how screwed you could be screwed. <laughs> uh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, yes. I mean, I think you could make some progress, but you're not going to be the best that you can be, right? You're not going to, not to use a cliche, which I just did unintentionally you're going to be able to do a lot better and, and not even know that you could do a lot better. So anyways, all right. Well, Johnny, I hope that answers your question. Um, if not, then I know we'll hear from you. Uh, we appreciate hearing from you all the time. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate all of you listening. And guys, if you have a question, don't forget to go to askdroneu.com. Get your question in because a lot of other people are thinking the same thing that you're thinking. So don't hesitate. True. And uh, if you're ready to be inspired and motivated to push your business and the competitive advantage, you're definitely going to want to check out thedroneu.com and become a member. Uh, we are adding layers and layers and layers of classes. So if you've been a member for a long time and you've been you've been holding on a lot because of the community, you're going to love this new content that's coming out. I I promise you. So it has really been my personal mission to take the quality up, to take the the deep dive uh, level of information, the data acquisition information up to another another level as well. Because unlike other people, we're not motivated by money. We're motivated about um, you know, we're motivated about our why, which is to truly bring liberty to people by letting and showing them the drone life and how you can escape the nine to five and do what you want while also helping people solve problems. And it makes you happy when you get to help other people out because they're happy. It's kind of a, a simple thing. But anyway, Indeed. that's going to do it for us today. My name is Paul. And I'm Rob. This is Ask Drone You. Ask Drone You.